In this video, we're going to go through the uh, mechanics prep solutions and just uh, point out a few things. So in the first problem, we had to uh, do uh, unit conversions here to convert, in this first problem, uh, 10 mil newton meters to foot-pounds force and then to also to inch-pounds force. So the main thing to realize here is just that you can, if you start out, say, with the 10 newton meters, you can always multiply by a quotient where the numerator is equivalent to the denominator. So for instance, right here, one pound force is equivalent to 4.448 newtons. So we just set up a quotient where the numerator is the same as the denominator. The same thing with this one, 3.281 feet is equal to one meter. So you can always apply these a quotient where the numerator is equivalent to the denominator uh, to do the unit conversions. And then the same thing um, to go for when we get foot pounds, then just multiply by 12 inches over one foot to get it in inch pounds. And then we do the same thing here with, uh, if we had a motor, our output of 200 inch pounds force per second. We multiply by one foot divided by 12 seconds, right? That gets rid of the inches. So now we have foot pounds force per second. And then we know that one horsepower is equal to 550 foot pounds force per second or 746 watts. They're equivalent. So again, we can set up this quotient um, and then just multiply through and then do that conversion to get that into watts. Okay, so in this next problem, we just had to uh, look at this force. It uh, is pointing to the left. 30 degrees up from the horizontal. It has a magnitude of 100 newtons, and the question was to determine the x and y components. So notice that the x component here is negative because we have x as positive to the right. Um, and then you just multiply by the magnitude by the cosine, and uh, then the sine is positive because it has it's, it's the, the y component is in the positive y direction rather than the negative y direction. So, so I think that one's pretty straightforward. And now in this case, um, we need to determine the resultant force. And so we're going to uh, add these three forces, F1. We'll label them F1, F2, and F3. Um, we'll break them into their components and then add up like components. So once we have all the X and Y components, we can add up all the X components to get the X component and the resultant and add up all the y components to get the y component of the resultant. And then once we have the, the components here, right, then we can just use the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude of the vector itself and, um, and then just uh, take the arctangent to find the angle here of the resultant. So the thing to watch out for here is um, the, we, so we're going to write these uh, components, and again, you have to be careful as to whether they're, they're positive or negative. Um, and so I, I think that problem's pretty straightforward. And then we do the same thing with this problem, except that in this particular case, we know the direction of F4, right? It's just, it's just pointing, it's just going straight down here. And um, we know the magnitude of F3, but we don't know the angle. So we can set up our equations. And then um, the question said, uh, d determine uh, F4 and F and theta 3, assuming these four forces are in equilibrium. In other words, assuming that they add up to zero. So they're, these are all the forces, say, acting on some point mass. And it's, it's not accelerating, so they have to add up to zero. And so by just setting up our equations now, you know, we look at this equation, the only unknown in this equation is theta 3. So we can just go ahead and solve that equation with theta 3. And then uh, if we set up this equation, now that we know theta 3, the only unknown left is F4. So now we can solve for F sub 4. Okay, so what we have here is... Uh, uh, a SOLIDWORKS sketch. So some of you may be familiar with using Fusion or SOLIDWORKS. And what I just want to demonstrate here is that we've, we've been at, we added these vectors by breaking them into their X and Y components. 
Another way to do this is, is to do them, add them graphically by Bush just putting them tip to tail. So in other words, you have uh, the 700 Newton. So the 700 Newton force is at 40 degrees here. And then we take the next one, which is 300 degrees. That one's at 75 degrees, right? 40 plus 35. So that one's here. And then you have the 600 at 40 degrees. Okay, so that one's this one. And then they're in equilibrium. So the last, um, I'm sorry, the resultant is just going to be equal to adding these graphically, right? Tip to tail. And then so we get this line. If I just click on that line, you can see I get 1125 and change over here. We, with the round off, we got 1126. And then the angle says 269. So that that's actually 269 from the positive axis, you know, going around past 180 to here. So if I subtract 180 from the 269, I get the 89.9. Okay. And then if we, let's see if I have that open. Okay. So now if we look at the other problem, right? With the other problem, we knew that this force was straight down. So again, I'm just adding these uh, vectorially. They have to add up to zero, right? So we have the 10 kilonewtons at 30 degrees. 8 at uh, 30 plus 40, so that's at 70. Uh, we have the 15. We don't know what the, the angle is, but we know that it's going to connect to a vector that's going to go straight down. So I just set this up and put everything that we knew, know, right? The 10 at 30, the 8 at 70, the 15, the length here, and we know this one's going straight down, right? I just have this little constraint which forces that to be um, um, uh, vertical. And so now if I click on this one, we can see there's the 40.5. And if I click on this one, we can see there's the length of uh, 20, 22.27 or 22.3. So this is just a graphical verification of this other method where we did the problem by using components. Okay, so now <clears throat> if we look at this inclined plane problem, uh, we see that <clears throat> uh, if you have this block and, you know, suppose we, we're not doing the whole free body diagram yet, here yet, but suppose we, uh, we wanted to do that and we wanted to have, you know, some normal force perpendicular to the plane uh, being applied by the plane on the block. And maybe there is some frictional force. You know, just call that F sub F. And we're going to end up, you know, do, applying equations of equilibrium. But instead of uh, having the regular horizontal x and vertical y, it turns out in this problem it's, it's probably easier to define x and y where x is going up the plane or down the plane and um, y is perpendicular to the plane. There's nothing magical about, you know, these directions. You can pick any directions you want and the equations will still work, but it just, uh, you know, algebra-wise, it just works out a little bit easier like this. And so now we want to break the weight into two components, right? The y component, which is going to be down, it's 8.66, right? It's just W cosine 30 degrees. And then the x component is down the plane, and sine of 30 is just 0.5. So uh, 10 times 0.5 is, gives you the 5 pounds. So... Um, yeah, just the thing to be aware of here, notice that uh, before when I had x components that were in the negative x direction, I put in a negative sign, but that was when we just, we had a vector, you know, we went, we didn't actually draw the f sub x of f sub y, so like f1, we said, well, that component's negative, but if you go ahead and actually draw it in the negative direction, in other words, this, this number is positive, right? But the, the diagram shows that it's in a negative direction. So if we were to, um, you know, some forces in the x direction, even though this is positive, when we put it in the equation, we see that it's in the negative direction. So we would make that minus 5, you know, if we were sum of for, summing forces in the x direction. So you just have to be careful that, you know, the fact that it's positive here just means it's in the direction shown, which is actually in the negative direction. Same thing with y. y is actually down. We say that y... The w sub y is positive because it's drawn down. That's the actual direction it's going in. And when you solve for unknown for components or forces like this, by the way, if you're not sure which way it's going and you just guess, and then you end up with a negative answer, 
doesn't mean that your answer is wrong. It just means that the force is actually going in the opposite direction of drawn in the, shown in the diagram. Okay. So in this particular problem, we're um, solving for the moment about the origin here, right? And we have this force being applied at this point right here uh, with x equals 4, y equals 3. And so the easiest way to find the moment about the origin here is to break it into two forces. The moment, a moment is equal to um, about a point is going to be equal to, like, so I'm just going to say, say we have a point here and let's say we have a force like this. We want to find the, the moment of this force about that point. Well, it turns out in, in a rigid body equilibrium, we can put that force, slide it anywhere along its line of action. And then the moment about this point is just going to be this perpendicular distance D, right? So the moment of this force F, right, that it's creating, oops, my pin isn't working quite right here, right? The moment is just going to be equal to, not sure what's wrong with my pin, F times D. Okay, so what you need is that perpendicular distance. So we could actually get the actual 30 pound force. We could have done this problem by just figuring out from trig what this distance is, right? And then at the moment would just be 30 pounds times the distance D, once if we figure that out from trig. And we'd get the same thing, 138 inch pounds. But you can see that it's easier just to say, we'll break it into its two components. So F sub Y, that has a moment arm of 4 inches, right? In other words, this, it's, it, here's its line of action, F sub Y. So there's the perpendicular distance to F sub Y. That's why we have, you know, F sub Y is uh, 15 times the 4 inches. And then F sub X, right, its distance is 3 inches. Its perpendicular distance to its line of action is 3 inches, so that's why we take the 26 times 3. And they're both creating a counterclockwise twist, so you may have heard the right-hand rule. So if the twists that these forces are creating about the origin are counterclockwise, we consider that a positive moment or a positive torque. Torque and moment mean the same thing. Uh, usually, if you're looking at a structure, you talk about moments. Uh, if you're talking about a like an, a transmission where you have a rotating shaft or like on a on your on a car, right? Then you talk about usually about torque rather than moment, but they mean the same thing. So, anyways, um, like I said, there's two ways to do this problem: either just take the 30 pound force and you got to figure out the perpendicular distance d to the original force's line of action, or you can replace the original force with the two components and then just figure out their moment separately and add them up. You can have times where the contribution from one component is positive and the contribution from the other component is negative. That, that's okay. They'll still add up to the right value. Okay, and then these last two problems I think are pretty straightforward. Work is force times distance, and you have to remember that it's, it's only the force that's in the direction of uh, the distance that actually does work. So in other words, uh, if you're carrying something horizontally and you're exerting a force on it up to hold it, keep it from falling, but you're moving at a constant velocity horizontally, <coughs> so you're not really exerting any force on it horizontally, then you're actually not doing any work on that object. Um, so, but if you're lifting something straight up, then to get the amount of work required, uh, then you you just multiply the weight times the distance up. So here we got a thousand newton meters, and then power power is just the rate that you're doing work. So if you know you know if you did a certain amount of work and it took you 10 seconds to do it, then you can calculate the power. And then here we just have we know that one horsepower is equal to 746 watts, so it's easy enough to convert the 100 watts to into horsepower. So I think that um, that uh, should give you a good idea. But um, if you have any problem with any of these uh, um, questions here, 
then please uh, watch the watch the Khan Academy videos and uh, come and get help. Talk to the essays or to the instructors.